Prabhu, what, what is your advice for beginners to when they start with being a monastic? Well, it's like, you know, contemplate the, the attitude for monastic life. Because uh, you're becoming a samana, which means you're giving up your rights. You know, you actually, when you become a, a bhikkhu, you're a samanera also. You, you know, you have to live without money and depend on alms, things like this. And, and we have rights to have money and have an active sex life and go where we want when we feel like it. And, <laughs> and so forth. I mean, the whole... You know, when you're living in the Western country and everybody's talking about rights all the time. People are always demanding rights. Human rights and equal rights and rights. So everybody's thinking about their rights. And then the summer of life is about giving up your rights and then performing your duties. So it's a total change from, from a worldly life where you're, you're thinking of yourself mainly. And the, culture in the West now is very much about, you know, equality and rights and all the, these very high-minded ideas. And a sense of duty is never mentioned, you know, what duty we have. And so that's why when you, you have to ask three times, you know, the ordination procedure, you have to ask three times. There's a logic to that in the Upasampada, so that, you know, we're assured that you're doing this on your own, you're not always holding a gun to your head or forcing you into it. And you know what you're getting into, you know, you study the Vinaya and things like that, so you know what is, you know, expected in the training procedures and whatnot, because it's going against the stream of the world. And it's very interesting what happens to your mind, because you can, you know, understand it and even appreciate it. But when you're actually living within restraint and in a structure based on a hierarchical structure, it brings up all kinds of strong emotional reactions. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's a wonder anyone stays. <laughs> because it, you know you're you're going against what you're culturally conditioned to believe is right and good, like human rights. Who can who can criticize human rights and things like this? It's just you know it's a time where freedom of expression. You know everybody, every little ethnic group is demanding their rights now. You know so the. Catalonians want to separate from Spain and the Welsh are aiming to, the Scots are planning to leave Britain and <laughs> uh, leave the Great Britain and and all these these ethnic groups that were under, you know, one general nation are now demanding their rights as separate national entities. So it goes on and on like this. I'm not criticizing it, but I'm just trying to point out how, you know, the, the, the zeitgeist of the time is one where you really are, you're, you know, this ancient tradition is about is anachronism in the present situation of how modern people think. And, uh, and so this is why, it, you know, it wouldn't work very well if the point wasn't for liberation from ignorance and suffering. So that's foremost, always keep that as your, you know, foremost in your mind. The whole point of this life isn't just to hold on to ancient customs and keep Buddhism alive or things like this. It's not about kind of propping up old traditions and things that don't seem to fit into modern attitudes, but it's about training yourself to observe, to be a witness to, uh, you know, the conditioning you have. 
and uh, and it works very well if you're willing to do it. You know, you can't we can't really negotiate our position in the Vinaya. You know, it's based on seniority, and it's a structure, an impersonal structure that the Buddha established. Seniority is terribly impersonal. <laughs> it's about who ordained first, not who's the best monk or the enlightened master. It's about seniority alone, and then that it doesn't matter about the personal aspect of it. But it will reflect that, you know. So, in this life, you have uh, if your if your role model is somebody like Ajahn Chah, well, he's you know for me he was the the top. I mean, I had no problem bowing and performing my duties to Lumpur Chah. But then I went to other monasteries where the senior monk I didn't respect very much personally. And then, you know, some, the conceit of not wanting to do all these things for a monk I didn't respect. But then the whole thing was, no, you're a junior monk, you, you perform those duties because that's your duty as a junior monk, not about just to monks you respect and, and like, but to those who are seniors, you do. Know, you do. <laughs> and so, it, it, but it, Without that, it wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I just follow more or less my own personal opinions. If I didn't have a, something to remind me of and help me to observe my own uh, ditimana, my own conceits, and uh, so I learned a lot from living in place, place, other monasteries where I, you know, I didn't approve of things, or I didn't particularly respect the senior monk, but I learned about how well, how conceited I am, <laughs> and how full of opinions I am, because uh, these would come up, and 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 they're based on, you know, maybe their vinaya wasn't very good, or things that I could justify, but then, you know, that wasn't the point of me being the, the kind of one who's judging everything and what, what's good and what's bad, but performing my duty within the structure. And I found that made life very simple for me all these years, because it, it's not about me thinking who's worthy and who isn't, it's about who's senior and who's junior. Now, contemplate that, it's, you know, I get a feeling for, for a traditional structure, a hierarchical structure, based on seniority because you're from Australia aren't you? so it's more like an egalitarian society everybody's as good as everyone else and, there's, and a hierarchy is a nasty word in, in America it was nasty word hierarchy and patriarchy <laughs> patriarchy you can have a good patriarch you can have a bad patriarch Patriarch in itself is nothing. It's just a word. <laughs> and then it, it works well if the patriarch is good. Or the, you know, the structure is based on virtue and, and that and sila. You know, I found mainly that the structure works. It's a patriarchal form. But it works quite well when the Vinaya is kept, you know, when it's respected. So... But this is to reflect on it. So you're not just operating from a Australian condition perceiving tendent habit to waking to more how things really are, you know, since you're using your intelligence to reflect. And then to watch your own feelings about such things. You know, like a, a certain words bring up strong feelings and like patriarchy could bring up very strong emotion in women you know it may not in you but whatever words you know whatever concepts or things that happen to you individually you know you can observe how you feel it you know whether you you they upset you or you're indifferent or you agree or whatever because it's it's you that observes the words themselves are just words. I 
I tell the story about living in England during uh, Mrs. Thatcher years as Prime Minister. And she was Prime Minister for about 12 years, a long time. And, and people hated her, at least people that came down from Bachi. And she was one of these words that would trigger off negative, strong and negative emotions. So I'd give these meditation retreats, and it had time to do with the metta practice, you know. I'd, you know, I'd go around, make it easy at first, like, around like a billion Chinese in China, the easy. Everybody could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, there are those that are far away and you don't know. It's easy to have metta pull. <laughs> and then it comes down to uh, more intimate relations and, and uh, parents and, and monks and nuns and so forth. And then, then I'd say, Mrs. Thatcher, you just feel really good for you. I hold that, you know, a powerful word because it, it, you know, people, uh, intellectually, they, they, you know, they knew they should feel, have metta for Mrs. Thatcher, but the word itself brought up this strong aversion to her, to that perception. And we all have those what you call buttons you pressed, you know, where you push this button and you kind of blow up where somebody else might not. And reflecting on that is also important to see where you're most vulnerable, where you lose it. Encourage you to, to just contemplate how to use this form. It's not, it's not a form that is based on you know, you can leave at any time, it's not a matter of, you know, you have to stay, uh, or you 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 know, you have a gun to your head, or that, because it's, you know, in Thailand it's very easy to disrobe. They don't have any strong reaction against disrobing. But also it's, it's a restraining form to make, to not to browbeat you or to beat you down into a conforming idiot, but a structure to live in which makes our life workable, where you can reflect on your own karmic tendencies. See them in terms of Dhamma, like all conditions that arise, or all those cease, the rising ceasing of conditions. and Because it's through that continuous reflection that you, you know, you begin to know this in a, in a profound way, not just an intellectual way. And then that, that which is aware of condition is not a condition. So you're beginning to discern awareness, puts you in this relationship to conditions, whether they're external, like what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or what you're thinking, to you know, the mental conditioning you have, emotional conditioning, but the awareness is unconditioned. It's a door, the gate to the deathless. So put yourself in that position by mindfulness, and then, then your relationship to the condition phenomena is observing, witnessing. Because we have to live in this conditioned realm till we die. So it gives you good opportunity. Mpo, <laughs> do you have advice to young terras? To young? <laughs> young terras. <laughs> Go bend the bar. <laughs> Just keep observing. Trust yourself to be aware of what even that perception of being a young Terra is. So just another conventional thing. I remember one monk in Amabhakti was, he, before he was a Terra, he said, he was always critical of uh, Ajahn's. And so the word Ajahn became almost, you know, like, I'm not going to be an Ajahn. <laughs> and so he, uh, 
he talked like this until he actually had ten consonants and then he became just like he did all the things that he was criticizing Arjuna's for because <laughs> you know we, we get attached to you know with having a hierarchical structure we get attached to our position in it too you know it brings up that sense of I'm an Arjuna or I'm senior to you and those are those are different that's Sakya Ditti again you know holding to the view these views. The views are okay, you know, but it's the grasping of them out of ignorance. So that, that's what, you know, avicca is the cause of all suffering. Ignorance. And then the realm we live in is a sense realm. We have to live in this state of, you know, continuous sensitivity till we die the human body and the senses and all this, the world around you, nature, the sun, moon and stars, everything is about conditioned phenomena. So then when you're identified with your body as who you are, then you, you feel helpless because you're, you know, you're, you're such an insignificant condition on the planet in this vast universe. And, and you know, around you is this vast kind of vortex of changing conditions, and, and you, you have, to, and they're affecting you whether you like it or not. You know, you're impinging it on your consciousness. They appear, rise and cease in consciousness. So consciousness is the only way out of it, not suicide or anything, but just beginning to recognize, awaken to this simplicity of knowing. All conditions are impermanent, and and not fav- not judging, not being caught in having to judge or prefer, but just observe, be the knower, the observer of the arising, ceasing, and that goes just for subtle mental states in your mind or external conditions that you see here, etc. That's the magic, that's the wonder of it, because you can actually, within the, this kind of very vulnerable form, awaken to ultimate truth, and discern it, know it, and re- take refuge in it. But when you're attached to your body, then you're, then you're in for trouble. <laughs> because that, you know, it gets sick and gets old, and and then we, we're living in a society where we, you know, we have strong views about who's good and who isn't. And, and so we're very, not physically vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable. And the world is just like a, you know, a frightened, fear, fear-ridden place. But in the Dhamma, then we, you know, we can bear with the changing conditions of our own physical form. And we, we know how to let go of all our emotional habits and views and opinions to abide in this state of awareness before the physical body dies. <laughs>